it's time. Turn it, turn it. It's every time, every time, it's every time. It's every time. Yeah, yeah. Consistent with the mission every time, every time. Drip. Drip on my wrist and neck, you know I shame. Drip. No cap on when I'm rapping, you can, can check, check it out for Every time, every time, it's every time, it's every time. I'm consistent with the mission every time. Yeah, yeah. Trip up on my wrist and neck, you know I shine. Drip. No cap on when I rap, and you can check it life a line. Every time, cut that off, DJ. What's happening, y'all? My name is Kyra Montero, man. Welcome to Board Talk, episode number four. I'm really excited about this episode. It's been some weeks since we gave y'all a new episode, and we definitely want to make sure that we gave y'all a new episode, man. This episode is presented by Frequency Canvas, and I'm very ecstatic about this episode because this is a, a good friend of mine, audio mentor, big brother. Who's going to be featured on this episode My guy Israel Music from Washington D.C. Legendary hip hop uh, Christian hip hop producer And audio engineer uh, Dove award winning Stella award winning Engineer and producer So a lot of gems is going to be dropped On this episode And we're going to call this episode The Art of Mitten And there's no script on this ep- episode There's no No outline The relationship is so long That me and this guy All we gotta do is just talk And uh, it's just gonna be Some dope conversation So what we gonna do We actually We're gonna call Israel Now And get him on the line And then we are gonna start Getting into what we doing So let's get him on the phone Right now What up, what up, what up? It's real music. What's going on, man? You 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 live on the on the board talk episode, man. What's good with it? Man, everything is everything. Crisis life, man. Life is beautiful. I can't complain out here, man. How's everything on you? Man, dog, man, as you know, cause you lived out here for ten years. It's Indiana, my guy. So it's it's dog, it was it's been cold the last few days and then these next few days it's gonna be sunny and then uh it's back to you know. That Thanksgiving type weather, man. So it's it's interesting here right now, man. Yeah, I was checking I was checking the weather out there just to see what it was <clears throat> on my phone. That joint said y'all was like in the forties. I was like, Oh nah, man. But yeah, dug it out. <laughs> dug it out. Bro. Hey man, you you in the East Coast, it ain't like you in Miami, dog. So you ain't got that much <laughs> you ain't got that much room to be judgmental on weather, my guy. <laughs> Uh, you got that right for sure. Hey, them 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 East Coast winners. Was what was worse, Midwest or the or the East Coast? What would you say? Oh, definitely Midwest by far. What? By far, bro. Like y'all went y'all winners is longer, and the win the the colders are cold. Like the coldest we get out here in DC is like we may have like one day where it's like twenty degrees, or maybe two days out there, like. The first time I came out there, it was like negative ten, negative twenty out that joint, like and be for, like that for weeks. Like y'all, y'all went to start in like October and don't end until April. Like I remember when I was out there the last year, it snowed on like April the fourth or something like that. It was nah, but yeah, Midwest is definitely you got you got to be a true trooper out that joint. Nah, yeah. I'm good on that. I've been in this joint thirty two years, dog. So I really uh. I really don't have no uh, no room to talk, man, because I I didn't been out here, bro. But uh, man, I wanna uh, I wanna dive right in, bro. You you are a legendary uh, producer and engineer within the Christian hip hop uh, realm, hip hop realm, and just music in general. You also became a legendary sales rep at engineer uh, sales engineer at Sweetwater when you worked there, and man, you're just full of knowledge, bro. And I wanna one episode is not enough to unpack like the mindset in the universe uh, that we call Israel music. But I definitely wanna wanna have a long we're gonna be on this episode. I wanna, you know, get some of that um and unpack some of these gems. But first, for people who may not know you, I wanna I wanna get into, you know, how you got to where you're at and some of the experiences. So you you grew up Born and raised in Washington, D.C. Uh, and just kind of like tell us your story, man. Like, 
how you grew up, how you got into music, how you accomplished some of the things within Christian hip hop, how you got the sweet water, uh, and then we can just go from there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, so definitely born and raised in Southeast D.C. to be specific. Like, anybody that's from the city, you got you to gotta be specific on what part you from because it's way different. Like, I'm from Southeast, which is, you know, considered one of the worst parts, if not the worst, especially in the 90s when I was growing up. It definitely was the worst. Mm. Like, you know, when you got the White House and you got the Capitol building, like, that's Northwest. So that's a completely different side there than southeast or even northeast so i grew up in the 90s man i'm an 80s baby i was born in 87 so you know young as be talking about chicago right now but like dc in the 90s was no joke like that's the reason why they even created like the war on drugs because you gotta remember you know dc is not the south and it's not the north so in the 90s, you know, Youngers was coming from New York with the drugs, coming to D.C. They was coming from Virginia, coming to, with the D.C. They was coming from North Carolina, South Carolina. Like, everybody was trafficking in D.C. I mean, so much so, when I was growing up, you know, I know everybody know about Mary and Barron. You know, Mary Barry, you know what I mean, so to speak. I mean, he was addicted to crack himself, and they voted mm-hmm. him back in. They voted him back in after he got caught and locked up for it. So that just shows you how, like, the mind state of the city was, man. Like, so when I grew up, you know, five, six, seven years old, you know, youngest was already telling me, like, look, man, if you take this package here, we're going to give you $100. Like, I didn't know what it was then because I was only seven years old, but they was trying to get me to sell drugs. That's just, like, how, how it is, man. Like, that's how you get into the game very young and very early. So, I mean, but I grew up in, you know, a single mother household, like 90% of everybody in the country, black men. So it was real hard. I'm the first of seven, seven kids. You know, I got three little brothers, three little sisters. So we all in the one bedroom apartment. It was tough, man. So, you know, how I really cope with the cope with the violence that, that was in my city was really playing video games, man. I'm a nerd for real. I'm, I'm a game of games, man, like. Since the, since the Super Mario Bros, man. So <laughs> I, I was just going in the arcade, you know, and the drug dealers would be betting on me. Like, because I'd be, I had one quarter, I'd be playing like Street Fighter 2, and I'd be on that joint for hours off the one quarter. So the drug dealers would come over here. I bet you can't beat Irk. You know, that's my that's my government name. I bet you can't beat Lil Irk in this game. So they'll step up, play the game, I'll whoop them. And then be the next dude, next dude, and my mother come over there. It's time for you to come in the house. So then when I go in the house, I'll be playing more video games so I can get better. So long story short, man, um, in 1999, so what was that? Yeah, I was 11, 12, 12 years old because I'm a gamer. Um, one of my best friends at the time, we heard about this game called uh, MTV Music Generator because we used to read the little gamer magazines, a joint called Game Pro for all the old heads out there, Game Pro and Game Informer, and they was like, it's going to be this video game where you can make music. And I was always a music head. Like, I broke my first album I ever bought was Tupac, uh, All Eyes on Me, at the same arcade that I used to go to. Mm. And I heard I heard uh, the California Love, mm-hmm. and what well, that was, 95, so I must have been like seven. I heard that, and I asked my mother, I was like, Mom, can I get $5? So I can go buy this album. Man, that was not enough to buy an album in 1996. <laughs> uh, like, albums cost 19.99. So I went over because I, I knew the arcade owner. And he, sold, he sold uh tapes. Went over that joint, put my little $5 down. I'm like, I want the Tupac uh, All Eyes on Me. That man looked at me was like, where's the rest of the money? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm <laughs> like, that's all I got. But he knew me because I was always in the arcade. He gave me this look like, Go ahead, man. Just take the tapes. Because it was two tapes. Like, because, you know, dual hours, two, uh, a double disc album, but it was two tapes. So he gave me the tapes, went home, put that joint on, man. I was in love with music every since. Like, that, like, that all eyes on me really did something to me. So when I heard about the video game a few years later in 99, I was like, let me try this. Because I love music. Let me try it. So me and my man, 12 years old, we used to play a game. So it was on PlayStation 1, matter of fact. And we would, you know, I make a beat. He'll go in the living room, watch TV, watch cartoons, and I make a beat. And then he would come in, listen to the drums, like, oh, that joint tight, or that joint 
God, but I can make something better. So then I would go in the living room, then he'll make it be that I come in and I'm like, oh, that joint tight, but I bet you I can make something better. And we would, we did that for a whole summer. Like we ain't even go outside, which is me and my man just making beats on this video game. And I mean, them joints was trash. I ain't gonna lie. Cause I still got some of them beats to this day or like on, on a tape that we made. And, um, that's how I really got my start in the music. It was really for my love for video games. And then that just turned into my love for music. And then, um, yeah, so 12 years old, me and him going back and forth. And then he kind of like, as we begin to turn to teenagers, like he, like I would say 14, 15 years old, you know, that's when your, your hormones start to kick in. So my man started going to the parties and everything. And he would try to convince me, like, man, they going down, it's a party down the street you trying to go to, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, nah, dog. Like, I'm trying to make these beats. I was serious about it. Like, I'm like, this is this is life. This is what I really want to do with my life, dog. He, he trying to go chase girls, chase whatever he want to chase. I was chasing a dream, dog. So it's like by 14, 15 years old, I really was like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So... I, moved, I actually moved to West Virginia um, at 15, and um, I moved with my father. Me and him started reconnecting. But long story short, I ended up getting kicked out at 16 years old, kicked out of the house. So I was living on my own. And me and my another guy, my, uh, he had a studio. He had an NPC and a Korg Triton. So I was like, oh, this is perfect opportunity because I'm just using this video game. And I was already selling beats for like maybe $100, $200 or whatever. But I'm like, dad, I've been reading about this equipment in the music magazines. And I'm like, he got real equipment. So I lived with him. Me and him was uh, paying rent for like maybe three years. And um, I was just selling beats to local artists, going around the hood, passing out my little mixtape at the time. Because mixtapes was popping back then. So I would burn yeah, the so. beats. Yeah, I was, that was back. Mixtape game was heavy. So I would be in high school, like, shopping my beats. Hey, you rap? Is a beat, so I sell one for like three, four hundred dollars a, a pop. That'd be enough for like some shoes, you know, little clothes or whatever. And so yeah, that's that's when it really really happened. But lo and behold, I ended up getting saved in West Virginia at nineteen. Um, and then at that point, like it was kind of weird because the same because I was just selling the drug dealers and, and, and real hustlers like that. They was paying me five hundred dollars a beat. And that's how I was paying my rent. And then it's like one day after Christ came into my life, um, I, I just had to stop all of it. I, they would come back the next day at the same house. Like, yo, yo, E, they called me E at the time. Like, yo, E, you got them beats? And I was just like, nah, man, I can't, I can't do it. They was like, dog, what's wrong with you? You just sold me a beat yesterday. I'm like, man, like I'm serving a boy. I can't really promote what you rapping about and be a Christian at the same time. So I lost a lot of friends at that time, man. And it was real tough, but you know, I, I thugged it out. So long story short on that. So at 19, I moved back to DC and uh, doing the same thing. But when I moved back to DC, that's when my, like my CHH career started. Cause I was still, even though I was known in my own little hood in my own little local area. Tell, tell the people nobody, what C H H mean. They might not they might not know that. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh Christian hip hop. Christian hip hop. Yeah. So I wasn't really in the Christian hip hop. Like I was selling beats of drug dealers, hustlers and, and shooters. Like that was all I knew. But I I was been making beats at that point from twelve years old to nineteen. So I already had seven years under my belt. So I was real experienced. But I was a baby Christian, so first of all, I didn't know any artists in CHH at the time. And two, like, I didn't even know who to reach out to. So I thought I really had to give up rap. But then my man Pablo, the one that led me to Christ, he was putting me on to, like, the old, old, like, Christian hip-hop, man. Like, he was putting me on the cross movement at the time. He put me on, uh, I want to say, Great Tree. that had, like, BBJ and all them dudes. I was listening to that, and um, I ain't gonna lie, like, when I first started listening to it, I was like, man, I don't know, like, <laughs> like, this, this ain't, this ain't tight, though, like, this ain't tight, man, like, cause I already knew I was already in rap in the hip-hop culture before I became a Christian heavy, like, I was already 19 by the time I became a Christian, so I was, I wasn't really feeling it, but then he was showing me, like, the old cross-movement stuff, 
He showed me uh, Ambassador. He showed me the truth. He showed me Flame. He showed me Jr. You know, he go by Courtney, Courtney, uh, Orlando now. Yep, yep. But J- yeah, but Orlando, like, I was like, oh, this is fire! Like, that was the first time I actually thought, like, yeah, like, rap, Christian rap can actually be tight. And um, yeah, so at the time, you know, he was discipling me at the time. And I just like really fell in love with Christian, uh, Christian hip hop or Christian rap or whatever you want to call it. Especially like the album that really sold me on like what I want to go hard in is, uh, uh, the truth, the drink called, uh, the faith. That was like the first album I fell in love with, like in Christian rap. I'm like, yo, this is incredible. Um, mixing wise, production wise, like everything was incredible. So, um, I'm 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 jumping through everything because this obviously it's a long story, but um, but yeah. So I was um, working on beats, and my man uh, EXO. I met him on Sound Click. Forget Sound Cloud. That's back in the day on Sound Click, boy. So like it used to be MP3 dot com for yeah, MP3 dot com. <laughs> what you know about MP3 dot com? <laughs> see you know, see you know, see you know, you know yourself. I'm about to say it used to be MP3 dot com, but then they went to Sound Click. So I was just posting my beats on SoundClick at the time, just trying to like get my name out there. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot. So yeah, my, uh, I went I went by Earth, but when I when I came to Christ, uh, long story short, a, a bit of my testimony, like I was real frustrated at God because the dude that led me to Christ, he was like, "Man, I had this dream last night, and I was walking with God, and I was doing all this stuff." And, man, I was getting angry, dog. Like, I was getting angry at my heart, man. Because I'm like, why God don't talk to me? You ain't no better than me. And so, like, I went outside. I literally screamed at the, at the it was nighttime. It was maybe, like, 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm literally screaming to the top of my lungs, like, God, if you ain't, if you real, you so much you real, you talking to Pablo, but you ain't talking to me, like, don't ever talk to me ever. Basically, I gave God an ultimatum, like, if you don't talk to me right now, forever hold your peace type stuff. And then, like, I went back in the house. I ain't hear nothing. So I'm like, all right, it is what it is. But Pablo had left the Bible at my desk. So I was like, I ain't had nothing else to do. I wasn't sleepy. Open up the Bible, man. And that joint, like, I still can't find some of the pages to this day, like, where I was reading that, man. But it really revealed a lot to me in, in regards to my family and all of that stuff came to pass too. So I went upstairs and, and cried out to God, felt the Holy spirit come upon me, man. I gave my life to Christ right then on the spot, just in the room by myself. And, uh, he changed my name to Israel. So that's why I go by, that's why I go by Israel now. Not, not, not Eric or whatever else, you know, I used to go by. And, um, at the time I'm like, I was just going to go by Israel just period. Like that was going to be my name. But I was like, that's kind of, that's kind of whack, like just going by Israel. So I was like, what, what, what can I add that spice it up? So I was like, music, like I do music. And I was like, oh, that's a tight punchline. Like it's Israel music. Oh, that makes sense. And that's why, I, I, you know, people that may know me from way back in the day, my tagline used to be like, it's pronounced Israel music because of Israel music. So, um, but yeah, so my name is Israel now. I go by that in real life and as a stage name. But fast forward to my man, Exo. He found me on SoundClip. I was going by Israel Music at the time. And we just started building. We started building back and forth, man. He's a real good friend of mine still to this day. Love him as a brother, man. He's been an instrumental part of my life. And turns out we was we was talking on uh, AOL Instant Messenger, the little AIM joint. And he was like, I know this dude <clears throat> from Cross Movement. I'm like, oh, where? He's like, yeah, his name is So I'm like, okay. I got, I had like 20 beats at the time. Um, I was like, I got some stuff I can send him now. So he connected me and him. Macadulo hit me up on instant messages, just like Exo said. Um, and from there, that's when I got my first Christian rap uh, placement. It was on um, Everyday Process, Out of This World. I did like four records on that on that album. And then from there, it really just kind of snowballed. Like I did the stuff for R. Swift. And you know, R. Swift... From there, I did Jay Sun, the uh, City Lights album. I did like maybe eight tracks on there, and then obviously Jay Sun is on what well, was on Lamp Mode. So I went out to Lamp Mode, did an internship, um, did some tracks for Stephen and Levite, did some mixing for Stephen and Levite, um, Shaolin, 
and it just kind of it just kind of escalated from there, man. And um, it, here we are, like here we are now. I can go on and on for the rest of the story, but that really is how it started, man. Like it started yeah. from video games. And then having good relationships with good people, and they put you on the good people, and then from there it just kind of snowballs. All right, man. Well, look, round, look, round of a round of applause for that for that story, man. I I didn't get a chance to hit that at the beginning, so I had to I had to throw that in there, man, because you know the origins of how people come up is is very uh, informative uh, and educational for the listeners. Uh, for sure, man. So that's that's definitely dope. And when he's talking about like city lights and he's talking about uh, the everyday process, these are Jason. You know, these are legendary Christian hip hop artists. And uh, he's talking to Lamp Mode Recordings, which was a legendary Christian hip hop label out of Philadelphia. This is the time frame of like 2008, 2009, mm-hmm. 2010. You know, yep. around this time period when when all of this stuff, which, which some people would call the golden era of Christian hip hop the t- you know the two- 2003 2004 up to about you know some people say 2012 2014 was like about a decade of just you know dominant golden era of the Christian hip hop aka CHH market so definitely and from you being in the CHH market that's brought you uh you know Dove awards that's brought you stellar awards is is you charted on billboards you've Millions and millions of streams, you know, thousands of records sold physically, uh, thousands and thousands of records. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's done amazing things for you, man. So, once again, um, you know, round of applause on that for sure, man. So, I, I want to I dive into the story just a little bit, not too much more time than I want to get into um, the art of mention, man, what this, what this episode is focused on. So, yeah. you went through some things. We don't have to get into those things. We went through some things, and that brought you here to the state that I live in, which is Indiana, and you worked at Sweetwater for like a decade. Can you talk about transitioning from being a full-time music producer and audio engineer to then going to actually selling the equipment you was using <laughs> in the studio? Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad. I'm glad you asked that because I, yeah, I kind of just kind of skipped over that part, but that's a very another very important part of my life. So yeah, so basically, I was doing my like I told you, I moved back to DC. Um, I was single, and um, I ended up getting married, and then you know I was still doing my thing. I was actually living out in VA, me and my wife at the time, and, um, and then I had my daughter, my oldest daughter, Justice. Actually, she just celebrated her 11th birthday yesterday so that just goes to show you how long ago that was but yeah man so uh we had we had a daughter but that's the thing about you know it's glorified in the music industry like yeah i'm doing music full time because i mean i ain't had no job i was doing music full time for for years like five or six years or whatever but the thing about it is like the way it works is you you don't get paid into the album releases which is cool when you single it's kind of cool when you when it's just you and your wife because y'all adults, y'all can handle, y'all can figure something out. You know what I mean? But once I had my daughter, it was just like, you know, labels wasn't paying on time, if at all. And then, you know, you would get to run around with different artists and it's like, hey, I want to buy this beat. And then you don't hear back from them. So I'm like, man, I'm not going to have my daughter going through this. You know what I mean? Like, I can't, I can't do this. So I was applying for jobs everywhere. I applied for a guitar center. I was just trying to get a, something that's consistent. You know what I mean? Because you know, you know, bro, you're an engineer. Like, one month you may make five five racks. And the next month you may not make nothing. <laughs> then the next week you may, you know what I mean? It's like, Boy. it's good money, but it, it's not consistent enough. And I'm like, I can't have this for my for my daughter or my kids at the time. So I applied for Sweetwater. I ain't know how much they was going to pay. I ain't know where it was. I ain't know nothing of that. But I'm like, I, anything's going to be better than having my daughter starve one day and then feast the next. So I applied for Sweetwater. This was back in 20... When did I start? My daughter's born in 2011. So yeah, 20, 2011. Yeah, 2011. Um, so I applied for them. They flew, uh, they flew us out there, did the interview... And then um, they hired me on. I was at I was in college at the time too. Um, I only had a semester left, 
And um, they actually told me straight out there. It was like, hey, Israel, you already got the job. But, you know, I, we think you should finish college since you only have a semester left for a bachelor's degree. In my mind, I'm again, I'm, I'm from the hood. So in my mind, I'm like, the only reason why I'm getting this bachelor's degree is so I can get a job. And you offer me a job without the bachelor's degree, I'm going to just take it. So it was like, okay, cool. It's your decision. So I packed up all my bags. I sold all of my equipment, my music equipment, so I can move out to Indiana. And, uh, yeah, man, I, I started working as a sales engineer. And um, really just pouring my passion of music into helping people pick the right equipment, man. Because like, I'm really passionate about equipment. Um, even when, like I said, since I was 14, 15, 16 years old, I knew what an MPC was. Not because I ever used one, but be, I was always reading up on like the latest equipment and all that other stuff. So, yeah, man. So from there, we'll, we'll just fast forward, you know, over the past 10 years that I did work at Sweetwater, man, I was able to build literally thousands of home studios, probably hundreds of professional studios. Um, and I got to learn a lot, man. I got to learn a lot, not even just about like studio work or mixing work, but live sound, um, you know, guitars, bass, you know, I learned the difference between a Stratocaster and a Telecaster, a five string bass versus a four string bass. I learned the difference between different tone woods and drums and how, you know, oak sounds different than, you know, birch. I learned all of these different things that I didn't really have in my repertoire. So, yeah, man, I, I had the chance to, um, and the same thing that happened in my music career happened in my sales career because, like, once you do one thing for one person, it begins to snowball and those people begin by word of mouth telling other people. So, yeah, man. Um, shoot, I built studios for Lecrae, uh, Beats by Dre, um, David Crowder built his home studio, man. And a lot of that came from my man, uh, you know, rest in peace, legendary, favorite producer all the time, DJ Official, before he passed. Me and him was real, 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 real close, man. We used to game, again, going back to the gaming, right before he passed, man. Literally, like, a week before he passed, me and him was staying up to two o'clock in the morning playing Call of Duty, just joking, man. But um, he knew this guy named Biz, and he was like, "Yo, um, Biz, I want you to meet Israel." So me and Biz got real close, and um, I started selling equipment to Biz and building up reach and stuff. And then that led to KB, that led to Trip Trip Lee. Like I did Trip Lee's uh, his church. I can't remember the name of it off the top, but I sold them equipment. And yeah, man, just people all over the world. So um, at that time, man, I think the dopest thing was that I was able to actually listen to the gear and compare it because that's the difference. Like a lot of engineers, you know, mixing engineers or or even uh, musicians, like you, you know what you like because you own it, but you don't really know the difference between a $300 speaker, a $500 speaker, a ten thousand dollar speaker and a hundred thousand dollar speaker. Like you haven't really heard those for yourself side by side in the same room. And I was able to do things like that on a daily basis. Um, I would take equipment home. I mean, you remember, bro, when I bought the SSL home? Like that was that was the dopest thing about the gig because it's like, oh man, I never used the SSL console before. You know what? I'm about to just take it home and use it for myself. See how, what it sound like compared to other things that I've already known and really just form my own. Not my own opinion, but really true fact. Well, as much fact as I could, you know what I mean? Because everything is subjective. But I really began to learn the differences between a tube microphone and a solid solid state microphone. A solid state pre versus, um, you know, a pre or op amp pre. I, I began to learn those things for myself. So, yeah, it was a real, uh, a real great experience, man. The people was great. The company is great. Um, but yeah, man, it was a great, great time period. Yeah, man. I mean, even, even for myself, like I pretty much know everything that a sales rep knows who works at Sweetwater because of, uh, all of the knowledge that you poured in, you poured all of that stuff into me and, you know, really taught me the art of, of, uh, mixing and, and, and recording, um, not so much mastering, but but still gave gems on on mastering because as an engineer you really focus on the on the mixing side of things. So I've, I've been able to really yeah. get some gems of it, and that is what we're gonna 
you know, transition into now. There's so much more that we can talk about, but, um, you know, I appreciate you sharing all of them details, man. So the art of mitzen, man, in one of the previous episodes, I did an episode on the six phases of music production. And obviously the first couple of phases you're dealing with, you know, pre-production stuff, songwriting and making a beat and, you know, arranging the songs and recording it and all of that. But there's a point to where all of these things have to be, have to be mixed. And, and, you know, all of these random pieces of a song, they got to be, they got, this puzzle has to be put together. They got to be shaped to paint a picture for the listener through the speakers. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to shut up and let the master himself talk about these things. So, so first off, what, what is mixing, right? What is, what is the mixing process? Um, you know, technically like, you know, by definition and just what does a mixing engineer do and what are, what are those responsibilities for people who may not know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what a, the very, to put it in the simplest form is taking all of the elements that was done in the, in the recording process, taking all those individual tracks and combining them into a two track is what we call it. Or, you know, I would, I would say that nowadays people would say, you know, when you export it to an MP3. So if you have 24 recorded tracks, you know, kick, snare, hi hat, vocals, guitar, all of those signals have to be combined down to just a stereo track so you can listen to it on whatever playback device you got. That's a very simple terms. Um, and that doesn't even like have to involve EQ, compression, effects, or anything. It literally is just moving the faders up to where the levels sound right to your ear. And then from there, you, you print it. Um, I mean, that's an old term, but export it in your <laughs> DAW and that that's mixing like mixing doesn't have to be a very complicated thing. It literally is just turning faders up and down. So everything sounds balanced and then you export it. That is mixing. Uh, that's the very basics of it, but just like any sport or, or any other thing, it's just like saying, you know, what is basketball? Oh, basketball. Like what's the premise of it? You put the ball in the hoop. That's a very simple concept. Put this ball in that hoop. But it's a difference between me and LeBron James, right? Like there's a whole nother level <laughs> to putting that ball in the hoop. So I can put a ball in the hoop and LeBron James can put a ball in the in the hoop. We can both do the simple task, but how do we do it? What's the process behind it? What's the preparation phase? How do you put your own sauce and your own swag on it? So that's what I really you know, dove deep into because I didn't start off as a mixing engineer. Like I said, I started off as a producer, but once I started to really like hear my tracks play back and, uh, you know, the, the artist would be like, you know, Hey, check this song out that we, me and you did, you did the beat and I would listen to stuff. And I'm like, this joint sound terrible. Like, how did you make it worse than what I gave you? I didn't understand that. So I really was like, man, send the vocals over to me, send the tracks over to me. And I'll go ahead and do it myself. And that's really where I got, you know, learn how to really mix. It was really out of a frustration that people was messing up my beats because I would spend literally maybe two days making the beat and then another week mixing it. Like I would do like six or seven different mixes. I'm like, hey, man, why that, why that kick ain't hitting right? So then I would go online. I would go on the forums. Gear Space was instrumental. And I'm like, oh, that's what 200 hertz mean. You supposed to cut that? What's cut mean? So I really would just like self teach myself, and then try it on my own, my own production, and then bounce it, go listen to it. And I'm like, and I would just learn from there. So yeah, to, to answer your question, basically, you taking all the individual tracks and you balancing them, and then you you want to export that into a song. But it's way more. It, it gets way deeper than that. Absolutely, and we we probably we're gonna have to do another episode uh, on you know to dive into those kind of because those kind of things because it gets it gets way deeper, man. There there are um, man, there's so much we can talk about, but for for people who want to mix, there are more and more people who are offering mixing services and be, and trying to become mixing engineers and. 
honestly, it confuses me because it's like out of everything in the record production process, you chose to be the engineer. Unless you really, 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 really are made for it, I don't understand why people want to be audio engineers when you could try to be a, a producer, a songwriter, a, a manager, <laughs> a label owner. Like, there's so many other. Uh, you know, videographers, like there's so many other avenues within the entertainment industry and the, and the music industry that you can be. But everybody now, like being an audio engineer used to kind of be nerdy or looked down upon from the cool kids. Now it's kind of like audio engineers are being celebrated as the cool kid because most artists now look at their engineers as producers. Right. You know, a lot of people don't even know right. the, the differences between producers and engineers because independent artists aren't educated uh there's not a lot of artist development by record labels and production teams like how it used to be so you got kids and young people who are putting out records on tiktok or whatever blowing up and they have no idea of how the music industry works how you know record production works they just kind of just doing whatever they feel off the vibes but that that is producing more and more Mitchell engineer than I've ever seen in my life. For an up and coming Mitchell engineer who can't afford all the the gear from, you know, to have a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar room, you know, maybe they only got a thousand, maybe they only got two thousand. Um, what what advice would you give for people who are just starting out, or for people who maybe been doing it a while and don't really have much, but they're trying to get to the level of a Israel music, to a, a, a Jason Joshua, to a, a Dave Pensado, you know, some of these legendary engineers in the Christian hip-hop world, to a, a, a Jacob Morris, a.k.a. Biz over at Reach Records, whoever it is that they're looking up to, like, what would what would your advice be? You know what I mean? For these... For yeah. These- yeah, you don't even... You don't, you don't need all that equipment, you know, to make a, to make a great sounding record. I wouldn't even talk about hit records because... I think that's I think that's the mis misconception. I think that that is the downfall of the engineering side that we have in these days. Because most, like you said, the newer the newer engineers, the the younger guys who are like, oh yeah, I can I can I can mix too. But the the, the downside of that is like they they want to make hit records. They don't want to make great sounding records. And because of the whole trend of TikTok and social media, most people are listening to those songs on their phones, which you can't possibly tell a great mix from a bad mix on a, on a one inch speaker. So you thinking, Oh, this song has a million views, 3 million views. I can mix. You really can't mix. It's just that people can't really hear the mix. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so with that being said, you know, if somebody does want to get an audio engineer, first things first, and you got to have a, a, a great computer, like before you even think about, uh, speakers, headphones, plugins, uh, hardware, if that's what the route you want to go. You know, let's say if you had a $2,000 budget, I would spend 1200 of that on the computer. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, if you, if your computer, I don't care if you got, you, I don't care if you got waves, you can get all the plugins in the world. But if your computer crashes every time you load more than six plugins, it serves you no good. It's like buying a Lamborghini but can't afford the gas to drive it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's So go ahead and get yourself a, a, a very nice computer, something with, I'll be very practical. I ain't going to talk in hypotheticals, something with at least 16 gigs of RAM, at least 16 gigs, um, at least, I would say, four cores, um, hard drive storage, that depends on you, you know, how much records are you mixing, how, how many times you want to, like, upload it to the cloud. But get your spend the most money on the computer at first because that's going to allow you to run the plugin. Because the any DAW you use, whether it's Pro Tools, Studio One, Cubase, Reaper, those plugins are honestly take it from somebody who who's used ten thousand dollar compressors and who has UAD and all of the plugins. You can be a great audio engineer with just the stock plugins. You can be a great audio engineer with just the stock plugins. So I would spend the twelve hundred or whatever. On, on the computer, get yourself a DAW. If you want to do pro tools, you know, your DAW of choice, they all pretty much do the same thing. I'm Studio not one is that. the best. 
Go yeah, ahead. nah, Cubase is the best, but it's all good. Studio though, One, we, I'm gonna let you keep that. Go ahead. Whatever you want, Studio One is actually is actually dope. Like I'm not gonna discredit Studio Version One. Version so Six, you get Studio One. Version Six just came out. It's amazing. Yeah, I feel you. So Studio One, you get Studio One. Cool. You know, now you up to let, let's just say your your budget is up to uh, let's say fifteen hundred. Then because if if you only have that amount of, here's what I want engineers to know. The most important part, the most important tool in an engineer's or mixing engineer's arsenal, I don't care if it's mixing or mastering, is your room, period. I don't understand why, like, when I tell people that, they don't believe me. They want to get the nice speakers. They want to get nice audio interface. They want to get plugins. But if you can't properly hear what you're doing, then it doesn't matter. That's almost like if I was a painter and I got the nicest brushes with the nicest canvas, but I got sunshades on. Like, I got red sunshades on. That's obviously, I, how do I know what's really red? How do I know what's really blue? I don't know because I have sunshades on, so your painting is not really going to come out the way you think it, it looks. It may look good to you, but when you take sunshades off, you're going to be like, oh, that's not even right. And that's why a lot of engineers, like, it sounds good in their room, but when you go to another room, it sounds horrible. So to negate all of that, if you can't afford acoustic treatment, Get yourself a nice pair of headphones, man. I love the uh, Audio Technica M50 uh, by Dynamic. They make great headphones. I mean, you can go to your local store and test out headphones, see which ones you like the best. But that negates your room. So, boom, let's say you spend two hundred dollars. Now you got seventeen, seventeen hundred. You got three hundred dollars. I mean, you can get yourself a nice audio interface for two fifty, two hundred dollars. It won't be the best, obviously. That's your job to get work in order to pay for better gear. That's the cru crucial element that people don't understand. They want to spend all the money on gear first and think the clients will come. That's actually backwards. What you should be doing is get the equipment that's in your budget and then work with artists that are within your budget that maybe don't have higher standards as like a Grammy award winning artist and work with your local people. They will pay you if your work is, if you can produce fast work, a quick turnaround and sounds decent, work with that. Don't spend any of that money you make. Put that in a separate account. Then when you get enough money, then you can maybe go to a Universal Audio Apollo. You can upgrade your plug-in. But that's what, what my advice would be. Get a computer, get a nice set of headphones so you don't have to worry about the acoustic treatment, and, um, and get yourself an audio interface. You're good to go from there. You don't need any control surfaces. You don't need extra plug-ins. And as a matter of fact, man, like these days, I wish I, I wish it, I was start a starting engineer because a lot of companies have subscription pro programs. Back in the day when I first started mixing, I was 17, 18 years old. Man, Wave's Gold cost $1,500. Like, we ain't had the money to do that, so we couldn't use it. But, man, Wave's got a subscription program for twenty nine ninety nine. You can have access to all their plugins. Plugin Alliance, I think it's nineteen ninety nine. You can have access to all their plugins. Steven Slate, I think it's twenty dollars. You can have access so for basically a hundred dollars a month, you can have access to all of the latest and greatest plugins for a hundred dollars a month. Now I know some people thinking, man, a hundred dollars a month, that's a lot of money for plugins. Well my my answer to that is if you can't make a hundred dollars a month in mixing and engineering to cover a subscription for your business, you shouldn't be engineering. <laughs> so, 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 check this. This is what we, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna break this up into two parts. Hey, y'all, look. This is the board talk episode number four. I got my guy Israel Music on here. We actually gonna cut this episode. This is part one of the art of mixing, and we gonna jump back, and y'all gonna have to go to the to the part two. So, Israel, <laughs> dropping these gems so far and we'll be back with part two